Good evening and welcome. My name is Jim Burris. I'm senior reporter at WABE Radio, Atlanta's public radio station. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Carter Center for asking me to moderate this evening's event. It was one year ago uh, this week when I was in Liberia uh, reporting on efforts to rebuild post-Civil War. And uh, the Carter Center was instrumental in helping me through uh, those stories and navigate the country during my three weeks there. So it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Conversations at the Carter Center gives us an opportunity to discuss important issues with our neighbors here in Atlanta and through our webcast with our friends all around the world. We encourage you to learn more about upcoming conversations at the Carter Center and watch past events at cartercenter.org slash conversations. Well, tonight we're focusing on Liberia, the African country born out of the work of the American Colonization Society in the early 19th century. For more than a century, Liberia's government, it's the first independent government on the continent, was dominated by a single party made up primarily of settler families who ruled in the interest of the small minority. They had not only the blessing, but also su the support of the United States. Following a coup by indigenous military officers in 1980, Liberia fell into civil war. That lasted from 1989 to 2003, with a brief interruption from 1997 to 2000 under the presidency of Charles Taylor. When the Civil War ended in 2003 and the interim government led the country to democratic elections in 2005, the people elected Africa's first female head of state, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. She vowed to rebuild the war-ravaged country and reform the political system. And since then, Liberia has been working to consolidate that peace with the full support of the entire international community. As President Sirleaf told the US Congress in 2006, quote, we want to be America's success in Africa. Well, this panel was constructed before Ebola. The deadly disease derailed the reform process and thrust the country's fragile institutions right into the glare of an international emergency. But last week, we're pleased to say Liberia's last Ebola patient left a treatment clinic and returned to her family. The lessons, therefore, from 10 years of peace building are both timely and critical as the Liberian government and her international partners seek to recover from Ebola and restart their previous recovery. Before Ebola, was Liberia heading in the right direction? Were there challenges and obstacles that they continued to face to peace? What lessons should be learned as the country enters the next phase of its efforts to put war and bad governance once and for all in its past? We're going to address those questions during tonight's panel. And before I introduce the panelists, I want to invite those of you who are watching the webcast to submit your questions via Twitter. To do so, just use the hashtag Liberia Peace. Those of you in the audience will have a chance to ask your questions as well later this evening. Now, let's meet our panelists. Dr. Pamela Scully wears a number of hats at Emory University, where she teaches courses on women's, gender, and sexuality studies, as well as African studies. She is an historian whose research and writing focuses on comparative gender history with a recent emphasis on sexual violence in war and post-war conflict, especially in Liberia. She's currently working on a biography of President Sirleaf. Elwood Dunn is a scholar, diplomat, and educator who has served in several high-level capacities in the Liberian government, including as Minister of State for Presidential Affairs. He has held professorships at a number of universities, a prolific orator and public speaker, he has been called upon to provide national orations of uh, Liberia by two Liberian presidents. Tom Crick is the Associate Director of the Carter Center's Conflict Resolution Program. He's worked on numerous Carter Center election and conflict resolution projects, including high-level uh, mediation initiatives in Sudan, Uganda, and the Great Lakes. Most recently, his work is focused on peace building and conflict prevention in Liberia, where he manages the Carter Center's Innovative Access to Justice Program. Please welcome me in, joining, uh, in welcoming tonight's panelists. over this way. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about several subjects this evening. Um, 
but in order to understand where we're going, we have to understand where we came from. And in order to understand the challenges facing the country today, we have to understand the history and the origins of the conflict that we spoke about earlier. Um, now, Dr. Dunn, you have written extensively on this, and in particular, the U.S. relationship with Liberia, which has sometimes been called America's only colony in Africa. So people often talk about one of the main causes of the war being an historic failure of governments, governance, rather. Uh, what's meant by that? Well, um, I think there are two ways of uh, thinking um, about Liberia or the Liberian state. One way of thinking about it is to see the experiment that started in the 19th century as an effort at installing in 19th century West Africa a little America. The other way of seeing it, the other vision, if you will, of Liberia, is that which was uh, expounded by uh, one of the foremost Liberian thinkers of the 19th century, a man called Edward Wilmot Blyden, who thought about Liberia as a place where one had come to build an African nationality, an African nationality that would combine a little of the West, but rooted in the culture and experience of the people indigenous to that part of, uh, of uh, Africa. Uh, I think what prevailed was the idea of building a little America in Africa. And if you look at the symbols of Liberia, you'll see a little bit more about what I'm talking about. Look at the flag, mm -hmm. look at the seal, look at the national motto, and you will see a little bit of what I'm talking about. So in a real sense, Liberia from its origin, the state, up until 1980 when the coup d'etat took place was an effort at installing this little America. And I think what the coup of 1980 was saying is, we don't want a little America, we want to build an African nationality. And I think the challenge since 1980 has been precisely one of how do you build an African nationality that incorporates rather than excludes the majority of the population and their culture, and their outlook, and their aspirations. Uh, I believe that what has been going on in Liberia, and I don't want to be too uh, expansive here, is that um, the coup of 1980, why it marked a brick from the past, uh, did not succeed in delivering the promise of change. And as a result, uh, Liberia degenerated into war. We all know about that because we are here to talk about post-war uh, Liberia. And I think the challenge that Liberia faces today and continues to face is that of finding a pathway that will take us away from the building of a little America to the building of an African nationality. Within the country, how, how is a an identity, an African identity, uh, kind of quantified? How, how do people of Liberia see that? Well, they see that in terms of putting in place a governance system that is inclusive, a governance system that addresses the culture of all of the people of Liberia. Uh, one, this is not an anti-American effort here. This is an effort at borrowing as much from the United States and from other parts of the world for that matter, but blending those with the realities of the population on the ground. And I think as we proceed, we will be talking about some of the uh, reform challenges that face Liberia, and then we will come back to some of those particular issues. The Civil War ended in 2003. Um, Tom, this question is for you. What kind of position did the country find itself in uh, explain for us kind of the baseline from, from where they started. There's a, a number of ways of, of looking at, at the idea of a baseline. Uh, and one is to say, uh, to describe the physical characteristics, to describe the destruction that was done to the economy and the, uh, and the political system. Uh, but I think it's important to, to recognize that um, despite the, the scale of the destruction, that took place in, in Liberia, 
uh, both human and physical. Uh, the political culture and the political history is something that uh, endured. Um, but in terms of the, the challenge that uh, the, the, the transitional Liberian government after the peace and then President Sirleaf's government and the, the whole international community who rallied round with the world's largest peacekeeping force and uh, proportionally uh, to population, one of the largest economic aid packages, uh, they were faced with a, a picture of, of, um, of institutional uh, devastation uh, where almost all of the, uh, the ministries and the offices were uh, gutted or, or been looted. Um, they're faced with uh, a population that was uh, over 50% uh, displaced. Uh, they were faced with uh, an annual budget uh, that would, uh, you know, in, in the two, I think it was $190 million uh, was the total budget for the, uh, the whole population when they, uh, when they began to take over. Uh, and then the, the, the psychological uh, challenges of, uh, of trauma, um, of uh, rebuilding, of, uh, of finding uh, a place to start. I remember talking with the uh, uh, Solicitor General who in uh, 2005, and, and uh, his approach was, well, we have to start somewhere because the, the, the uh, inability of the government to simply have the resources to perform the functions uh, that would uh, allow you to call it a government was, was very high. Human resources, uh, material resources. Uh, this was a country that um, was really starting from as, as low a base, I think, as, uh, as perhaps the, the, the world has seen in, in recent years. Mm -hmm. Can I add to that? And I think um, what Professor Dunn was saying has a bearing on this too, is that the war had devastated Liberia, but you had a, a long history of this little America where the resources really had been put towards Monrovia. So you had an infrastructural history of not looking after the country that was then compounded by devastating war. And so, so that leads to what you know, Tom was saying about could you get any lower, really? You had a history of, of not... Uh, giving accesses to people, access to you know justice and everything else, and then you had a devastating war. So it's it's really uh, it was profound. And I was there in 2008 with the Carter Center, and even then there were people living in Monrovia on rubble. And I, what one what struck one was how so many people you know you could probably you know diagnose them with PTSD. That that everybody was suffering deeply, and I, I at least saw the um, these communities of living on rubble, that they literally were so traumatized they couldn't even move the rocks so they could be comfortable. Just, just incredible devastation. And this was five years post? Yes, 2008. Mm -hmm. I want to stay with you. Um, in 2005, Liberia made uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf president, and it was the continent's first elected female head of state. Internationally, she's been lauded as a symbol of hope and change as well as a, a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. At home, though, she has critics, and those critics charge her with failing to address corruption, nepotism in government, and presiding over a government that increasingly resembles the discredited political systems of the past. Mm -hmm. Not much change has changed in some people's minds. How would you assess the president's contribution uh, to peace and development? I think it's really challenging. I mean, she inherited the country that uh, Tom Crick just described, um, so she had an incredible burden. Uh, I think her first term, uh, people were more satisfied. Uh, she did try to put things into place. Uh, she has tried to reform education, give access to girls. But in particular, um, there, she has uh, tried to renegotiate some of the big concessions with Firestone, for example. Um, she t tried to make government more responsive. So I think in the first term, people you know, gave her credit. I think a lot of the dissatisfaction has come in her second term, um, where indeed there are charges of nepotism, corruption. Uh, she herself, I think, defends, says she's done all she can with regard to corruption, and that part of the challenge in governing Liberia is what she talks of as an issue of capacity that to run a really excellent government, you need people who are educated and able to do the job. And in some of her 
recent interviews, she's sort of alluded to the fact that I think she feels somewhat disappointed that maybe they're not people who are able to do the job. And she has relied a lot on bringing uh, Liberians from the diaspora back into government, back to Liberia. But I think one of the, the charges that is sticking is nepotism because her sons have been in important positions in Liberia. Uh, her one son you know, ran for the Senate and was very roundly defeated by her previous uh, opposition, uh, George Weir. Uh, so I think increasingly, um, as her star rises in, in internationally, she's won every international award you could imagine, uh, there's more and more concern in Liberia that is she really paying enough attention to people on the ground? Um, Dr. Dunn. Yeah, I, I think President Selyev is a substantive uh, leader, and um, I think she's a real blessing to Liberia. However, um, I think the problem has been one of a focus on more on tangible mm -hmm. things and less on the intangibles. Um, I think she started off her term basically saying that these two things were not mutually exclusive. They were mutually reinforcing. But somehow it appeared that, um, well, and one can probably understand looking at the devastation that the country faced at that point in time, uh, that one was interested in addressing the debt problem, addressing uh, the infrastructure problems and so forth and so on. So that the soft issues, the governance issues, became, uh, were put lower on the scale of priorities. And I think uh, moving into her second term, she began to raise those intangibles. Uh, for example, the whole question of constitutional review has been at the center of things having to do with reformation in Liberia. Uh, when did we start this? We started this in 2012. Uh, and we are some ways, you know, we've made some progress. There's still some problems. We can talk about that a little later. But the point I'm trying to make is that I think that the uh, combining of those tangibles and intangibles is what needed to have been done from day one. And I think the fact that it was not done created some difficulties. Do you consider that then a criticism of the president's first term? Precisely. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Um, and um, somehow we have made some headway on these reform issues um, since the second term started. Of course, uh, Ebola has now intervened. And what we now have to look at is what the agenda is going to be going forward from now to the end of her, ter of her term in 2017, whether there will be a kind of uh, uh, recalibration, if you will, here, yeah. uh, re rearrangement of, in of things such that one is able to put those governance issues where they belong, uh, where they ought to be uh, if, if Liberia is to achieve, uh, I think, its developmental objectives. President Sirleaf has the ability to appoint cabinet members, actually government representatives at all levels. Um, some have called that an unhealthy centralization of political power. Uh, reformers, including the president herself, have argued that political power needs to be more evenly distributed. So what are the challenges involved in reforming that? Um, I, I guess what I'm asking is how easy is it to actually implement? You mean reformation and so forth? Um, well, you know, I think, I, I think it's important to mention here that the government undertook an initiative called Vision 2030. And the purpose of that initiative was precisely to put the whole developmental uh, agenda within a broader framework. Uh, again, trying to go back to what she started doing at the very beginning of her administration. That is, we are going to do the intangibles, and we will also do the tangibles. We will do both together. Um, this process, this 2030 process, um, um, was something that uh, worked itself out uh, over a two-year period. And at the end of the process, um, the, the conclusion was reached that um, Liberia would adopt a scenario 
that is referred to as the developmental state scenario. I think they came up with a slogan that, if I remember the, 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 the wording exactly, it went something like, one nation, one people united for sustainable peace and development. And this was a process that was arrived at uh, as a consequence of wide nationwide uh, consultation. So there were, the people were consulted about what it is that they wanted their country to be like um, 18 years down the road, you know, sort of uh, what sort of life would you like to, to see? Uh, and uh, I think, uh, to be brief, one of the things that came out of that consultation is what we have today in the Constitution review process. And I think it's important to point out that in that constitution review process, uh, all of these, these, these major issues having to do with land, uh, having to do uh, with, uh, with uh, cultural issues, having to do with uh, governance issues, the whole question of the imperial presidency and what to do with that, having to do with uh, decentralization issues. Uh, all of those issues are the kinds of issues that the, the Liberian people have been been talking about during the process of um, the national consultations. And I should add that the national consultations took place not only within the uh, 73 electoral districts of the country, but it also took place in the diaspora. So we came over here and consulted with Liberians in the major metropolitan areas in this country, I might add including Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we went around. So there are Liberians who have also been given the opportunity to say their piece about the kind of country that they would like to have or the kinds of changes that we would like to see uh, brought to their, uh, to their constitution. When will that come out? You mean the, the constitution? Final, the final, final. Well, uh, there is um, a national constitution conference that is scheduled for Banga between the 20th and 27th of this month. And uh, at that conference, uh, a number of documents will be put on the table, the first one being the um, proposals for change. Uh, and I, I, I'm not at liberty to, to say too much about that at this point in time because one is still going through all of that. But the proposal for change, um, in other words, what the new constitution would be like with the changes uh, introduced and a full report of the entire process. We can't talk about Liberia without mentioning Ebola. The, the two became synonymous, and I would venture to say it's how most people, um, at least in the West, came to know Liberia. Um, as we look at governance in the state and where it is in rebuilding, what did Ebola tell us about that? What impact did it have, and what, what have we learned from that? And, and this is open to anyone who wants to chime in. Yeah, it's uh, on, on the surface, Ebola lifted the lid on the, uh, the degree of administrative uh, frailty uh, that existed in, in the country, particularly the, uh, the healthcare system. Uh, which was very quickly uh, overrun um, by the extraordinarily difficult challenges uh, of, of Ebola. Um, but uh, at the same time, it also uh, showed that the, the national uh, progress and trajectory that, uh, that uh, President Sirleaf, despite all of these challenges, had uh, managed to, to establish was, uh, was very fragile. Um, and so one of the things that Ebola offers us is a window to uh, reconsider what the, the strongest path of, uh, of support and for the Liberian government and people to, uh, to look at what has happened before. Um, and Ebola in some senses can can perhaps provide that moment of, um, of reflection uh, so that when we're rebuilding now, we, we, we're learning those lessons. Um, but the main, uh, the main challenge there was really that uh, the state um, didn't operate uh, very well um, in even within Monrovia or outside Monrovia. 
and the, uh, the enormous uh, trust gap uh, mm -hmm. between the population mm -hmm. and the government became, uh, became uh, apparent, uh, where people were not believing what they were being told uh, about the disease in the first instance. They were resisting uh, the overtures of, of health workers, local and international. Um, Many didn't actually believe Ebola was uh, spreading through the country. They didn't believe the government. That, that's, uh, that's, that's a, that was a part of the challenge. Uh, now, the, that today, is, as you said, we're, we're sitting at a, a much different point. Uh, and so we've also seen that with uh, the right kind of education and the right kind of um, vision for, for change, uh, there can be uh, a sort of unified and uh, collective national action in, 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 a, in a common direction. Um, the, the way that the Ebola uh, disease has uh, um, dissipated uh, has been extremely rapid and, and has required each and every Liberian to sort of follow, the, uh, uh, follow similar protocols. I also think, I um, agree with everything Tom just said, but I think it also revealed um, the challenges of, of uh, the sort of global partnership with Liberia and with President Johnson Sirleaf in that the lack of trust was also because the government was seen as very much in uh, partnership with um, international development uh, agencies and individuals who didn't initially understand Liberia and came with their own agendas. And so uh, I think one of the, the things that Ebola revealed was, was that um, Liberians had a real skepticism of experts who've been coming to Liberia for a long time, especially since the end of the war, telling Liberians this is the way to govern, this is the way to have health care, this is the way to stop gender-based violence. And I think there was a reason that many Liberians did not trust experts saying there's now Ebola. Uh, a, there was no history of Ebola in Liberia. Uh, B, people were now being told they shouldn't eat bushmeat and had been doing so for a very long time. Um, and so there's some evidence coming out that in fact it had some of the deforestation happening around the Guinea-Liberian borders yeah. is changing the relationship of people to the environment and making um, bats and people compete for foodstuffs and bringing them to much closer contact. And so there's, there's, in a way, also some of the history of development in the region is actually contributing to the ease with which Ebola you know, it was introduced into the arena which is just to say that there's a very large context here for the lack of trust that uh, many Liberians expressed at the beginning of the Ebola uh, outbreak. But also to what Tom was saying, um, I think it's a really fantastic uh, testimony to Liberians that they, I think by and large, they have stopped Ebola by, by adopting different ways of greeting, by, by, by themselves, again, understanding what they need to do, not, not necessarily what experts are saying, that they recognize what had to be done, haven't done it. So there's, I think, no cases left at the moment in Liberia. The handshake, which when I was there, I had an awful time learning, uh, was suspended, as I understand. Uh, Dr. Dunn, <laughs> have, have they re uh, restored that now that Taboo No, I think it's too early to restore mm -hmm. it, yes. Yeah. Uh, we have to ensure that we don't uh, uh, return to the old habits too, too early because we still have a challenge in the region. This mm -hmm. thing isn't gone from Sierra Leone and Guinea, and it hasn't officially gone from Liberia either, so we have to be slow in terms of uh, going back to the, the habits uh, previously. Uh, what, what I wanted to say, though, has to do with the role of communities. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there has been a kind of historic reluctance in Liberia to devolve power to move power from the center to the periphery. Uh, it, it, the government started a long time, probably about 2008, with this decentralization uh, program. Uh, and only since Ebola that we have seen the president go to Banga and hold a huge conference, and the intention of this conference is to ensure that uh, people, teachers in the rural counties can receive their salaries in the counties rather than having to come to Monrovia, the capital, to receive their salaries. People in the rural counties can uh, get their driver's license and get their license on their motor vehicles in their counties rather than coming to Monrovia to do this. Uh, I, I think uh, the government has had good intentions for doing this, but 
the, 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 the push to, to bring this about uh, has not been there. And I think Ebola has now uh, led the government to, in fact, move in that direction. And I, and, and I think when, when the final chapter of this part of the history is, is written, uh, I think uh, a great emphasis has got to be laid on the role of, of individuals in communities and, and, and the role that they played uh, in terms of uh, providing the, the foot soldiers, if you will, uh, to carry out that. The international community played a significant role, the Centers for Disease Control and you know, the United Nations system and so forth and so on. But they themselves recognized that they could not do the work that they were doing without the role of uh, people in community. Look at what happened at West Point. Th mm -hmm. Those of you who are familiar with Liberia uh, are aware of the fact that um, a huge slum area in Monrovia called West Point was quarantined. Uh, uh, militarily quarantined, I should say, and it ended up in a complete disaster. Uh, and I think the government uh, uh, understood the mistake that it made, it, it rectified the mistake, but not before uh, a young lad lost his life and uh, a number of other ugly things uh, took place. So I guess the point I'm trying to underscore here is the need for the government to move forward, even, even in so far as constitution review is concerned, in terms of the decentralization of power, putting an end to the quote unquote imperial presidency that we have had in Liberia for so long, and moving, moving government, if you will, closer to the people, uh, making it possible, for example, in Liberia for us to, uh, for the people to elect the leaders at the county levels, to elect the superintendents of the counties rather than having the president appoint the superintendents of the counties. Uh, those are some of the things that are uh, uh, at the top of the agenda, if you will, as we talk today about um, constitutional amendment. I want to ask you about the role of town chiefs in, in what Dr. Dunn just uh, described. And for those of you who are not familiar in some of the rural areas, you might want to mm -hmm. explain what the town chief does. Well, the, the, the chieftaincy system in, in Liberia is the historic underpinning of, uh, of all governance and uh, belief systems. Um, that has had layered upon it uh, the, the, the government uh, since the um, 19th century. Uh, and since the war in particular, a lot of fragmentation has taken place uh, within the chieftaincy system. So it, it's hard to describe a single system. A chief may have authority in his town uh, by lineage. He may have it by virtue of being uh, a strong religious uh, leader in the customary sense. He may have it by having been the, uh, the strongest person who happened to be there uh, during the war, um, and he may have it by um, uh, appointment as well, as, as the chieftaincy structure is uh, part of the, uh, the national uh, administration. Uh, during the war, as with, with much of Liberia, uh, there was a, a sort of a, uh, the, this mass fracturing and devastation, as I said, and so coming out of the, the war, uh, the question is what institutions uh, continued to exist, what institutions continued to function. Um, and gradually over the last 10 years, the, the, the chieftaincy structure, at least at the, at the very grassroots and, and through, through uh, national leadership, uh, with um, uh, who, the national leaders asserting that they are uh, not politicians, they are somehow guardians of of the culture and the custom um, have started to uh, uh, you know, voice the, the, their thoughts about the future through processes such as uh, Dr. Dunn is uh, involved in through the visioning and through the constitutional uh, process. And so in some senses there is this sort of, there is an underpinning of structure uh, that when the reform system uh, comes down and decentralization or deconcentration uh, happens, um, there is the, the possibility if the connections are made uh, correctly and, and each side sort of respects the, the role of, of the other, uh, that some sort of 
um, common uh, vision of the state, or at least a, a version of the state that isn't viewed by the people at the bottom as predatory, uh, but that the state works in their interest, could, could develop. And part of the, the Carter Center's work has been working uh, not just with the chiefs, but on these issues of rural justice and trying to uh, establish connections and, and even um, rebuild some of the trust between uh, the government and, and, and the governed um, at these very, very local community levels. In just a few minutes, we're going to take a break and invite the audience to ask questions. If you're watching via webcast, a reminder that the hashtag is Liberia Peace. If you would like to submit a question for the panelists, and Tom, I understand that we have a, a video. Thanks. Yes, um, and this is the the, the Carter Center commercial break, if you will. <laughs> uh, but but more seriously, uh, when the Ebola crisis uh, hit, um, you know everybody put their their shoulder to to the wheel, and, and we like like others um, adopted our, our programming and our strengths. Uh, and we were invited by the, uh, the government to help to uh, mobilize the, uh, the chieftaincy uh, structure uh, in support of the, uh, the national Ebola effort. Uh, when the, the first Ebola cases came and we were reading about resistance in communities, um, this was in part a problem of understanding that the communities didn't know what Ebola was and in part a, a problem of uh, what they call community entry. That, you know, who are these strangers dressed in these, these space suits coming into our, our sort of uh, forest uh, communities? Uh, and so we have established good relationships and, and trust with uh, um, uh, communities uh, at, at various levels until we're able to use these um, to, uh, to, in the first instance, uh, do some national training, then to bring together, um, along with the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, the international uh, partners in the CDC and WHO and others, a, uh, a national gathering of, of chiefs and elders at which they pledge their support to the Ebola effort, including um, suspending practices of washing bodies uh, and other things. And this little uh, video we're showing uh, is uh, sort of describes that uh, that work a little bit. I, I should say, for for the uh, uh, our, our partnership principle is always that uh, we work uh, at the request and in the interest of the government. Uh, we have other footage that's not in here of the uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, um, you know, speaking effusively in support. So this is not meant to be too self-referential. Uh, but I, th I think you'll get the, the flavor of, uh, of not just the work we've done, but the possibilities uh, for, uh, for building on, on community interest and in, in strengthening their own, own lives and connecting uh, to the state. So Great. Let's take a look. So, yeah. Most of these people that were dying were the country people, were the illiterate people, people who could not read and write. And I can tell you that when you look at these kind of people, they are in the majority in that country. And if in our country here today, uh, if you don't deal with them, things will go off here and a lot of people will die. First, we did an assessment uh, and we did some county wide training in the 15 counties where we did Ebola 101 training with the chiefs. They were suggesting that it was better for us to go at the district level to conduct uh, training. At the district level, you have more chiefs coming from the lower end, meaning you get chiefs from the town, the clan, uh, you have uh, women leaders, you have youth leaders at that level where they will be able to engage. We work with uh, UNFPA, uh, CDC, uh, and WHO, all of these different partners went to the forum to explain to the chiefs. And at the same time, we were also asking the chief their role. We all should start from bearing. If anyone died, 
we call on the, 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 the barrier team to come and do the barrier. Your duty is to report to the town chief. The town chief will make it his business to call to the clan chief. From the clan chief, the clan chief will inform the district of the, the, the department and I will be informed. This time around, they are talking, they are coordinating, the chiefs are supporting the health workers. So this way it's easier for county health team to be able to trace. And the, the difficult thing is to trace contacts. As you know, uh, the virus spread through contact. That's the main uh, mode of transmission. So if these people, for example, in all of the, the villages in the community, they have structures set up. If you went into a traditional setting today as a stranger, you have a stranger father. Your stranger father will have to report to the chief and say, I have a stranger. That way they know where you, who you are and they start to monitor your activity. If anything goes wrong while you're there, they will hold your stranger father responsible. We have a very good team, a very strong and committed team, and we rely on our teamwork uh, and the motivation the guys uh, have to work in the field on difficult circumstances where in some of the community they have to walk, they some have to go on motorbikes, some have to go on kinos. Uh, people live in challenged areas and I'm prepared to go through to meet with them and make sure they have access to information about health. And so even though some of the areas are travel with areas where they have not have motor road or car road reaching, but I managed to go through there, those places through crossing rivers, crossing creeks, walking through the jungle and getting to the people in those communities. Those communities have people living there, they are human beings, and so they need to have information. And more or less, they don't have access to communication in terms of radio and telephone. And so we have a team of three in each region conducting training at the district level. Uh, the health ministry will provide the training. The ministry of health will mobilize the chief. We will provide logistics. Ebola, we're talking about Ebola. We say that sign and symptom of, other, uh, of Ebola, other signs. We say weakness, we say running stomach, vomiting, the person get fever. And one of the things that we've uh, worked with to reinforce is the issue of coordination, the, uh, the issue of collaboration. Um, you have so many people working, too many people talking. Uh, in two, three months back, uh, my issue was we should add more and talk less because we were talking plenty and we're not acting. So now you can see people work, uh, doing more. Everybody putting their eyes together and everybody trying to do something now. And once we do it in a coordinated fashion, once we collaborate our efforts to be able to work together, I think we can achieve more. The Cardo Center played an important role by bringing the chiefs together. And we know that the chiefs has power in our various districts and towns. So in this fight, they told the wise that the chief will also help because back then, we got feedback that the GCSV were carrying on the work, but the chiefs were not helping, meaning that the chiefs would not allow them to contact tracing social move activities within their district because they felt they were not um, respected. So now, with the cardio center involvement, things are on course. The chiefs are even explaining things that they would do work with the GCSV, come up with some of the laws and rules and regulation and even bylaws and constitution for the violators of their various districts and towns. While we're doing this, there are also suggestions now that we should go at a clan level. Because again, the, the lower you go, the more people you get. And the more people you get, the more information will get up and the more people will start to conduct themselves and try to support everything. Because of the Cardo Center that we are even out here today, it got to a point that we did not even know what was happening in the counties, how our people were dying, whether our people were being educated uh, uh, to the danger of the disease that has come. It is Carter Center who had to bring us out to expose us. In some of the areas, you have resistance. When people went for bodies, when they were, uh, they were looking for sick people, they were resistant. We've been trying to work to change that changing that resistance to assistance. So one of the things that we've been able to do from uh, our engagement with the traditional leaders is to be able to bridge the gap between the chiefs and the health team. Excellent, and, and now we look at <coughs> post Ebola, two years away from uh, the country's first transitional democratic election. And I wanna address this to you, Dr. Um, Dr. Scully, the 2017 elections, 
how is the country poised? And uh, we actually got a, a question from Twitter in relation to this. Uh, what will the recalibration of the Liberian government look like post Ebola as we head into the election? And actually, I feel uh, Dr. Dunn is probably more <laughs> equipped to ask that than me. But I do think um, that one of the challenges well, let's say one of the successes of President Johnson Sirleaf's term as president is that there have been there was a democratic election and another democratic election, and that in Liberia there is vigorous um, dissent, and that is a good thing. Uh, one doesn't want to see a country where people are uh, nervous about saying what they think, and if you read the Liberian newspapers, people are very clear about what they think. Um, so I think. Uh, I think she, she has left a legacy for Liberia that, while imperfect, um, is actually, has put Liberia on a, on a very good road. Uh, what will come in 2017? I'm going to turn to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a good start. Uh, I think it's good that we've had two successive successful elections. And I think we will have a third successive successful mm -hmm. election come 2017. The question is, what sort of Liberia are we going to see transitioning from Sirleaf to post Sirleaf? Are we likely to see continuity or change or both? I mean, we are speculating as we speak. We know, for example, that there, uh, there's a long list of very ambitious people wanting to be president. Um, some of them are part of the ruling party. Um, it's unclear whether the ruling party itself has its act together to ensure that it remains the ruling party. Um, uh, there are all kinds of other forces out there. My, my guess is that uh, when the time comes, and perhaps the time is going to begin coming next year, uh, when uh, it's clear that uh, people need to begin organizing themselves, uh, I guess I should say my hope is, rather than my guess is, my hope is that um, the various political forces will opt to come together. I mean, so that if, for example, one imagine 12, 15 candidates for the presidency, that those would be reduced to maybe four groups, where each group will determine who should be the candidate to carry forward. But I think the more important question, beside the question of personalities and who becomes president, is what is the direction that those candidates wish to take Liberia in. If, if, if it is the direction that um, is clearly outlined in the Vision 2030 thing that I was just talking about, meaning developing a, a, a state, a developmental state, a state that will take into account both the tangible and intangible things related to Liberia, meaning uh, continuing with, the infra, with improving the economy, continuing with education, continuing improvement in agriculture, infrastructure development, and so forth. But at the same time, taking into account, seriously into account, the soft issues. So that even if we were to imagine a situation where we did, were not uh, very successful with the whole question of bringing the constitutional review process to a conclusion, meaning a referendum, because that's the conclusion, where the people would then finally say, yes, we want this constitutional change. That, that successor government will want to pick up on that and run with that, carry that forward. I think to the extent that that successor government considers it important to continue on the uh, reform trajectory, I think to that extent we are likely to see Liberia in a better place. Dr. Scull. Um, and just I think what I'd add to that is uh, that we talk about sovereignty in all countries, but uh, countries are also operating within a global world where certain kind of policies are favored, where particular supporters uh, are, you know, supported. And so I think, you know, in reflecting on President 
uh, Johnson Sirleaf's presidency, she, she became president in an era where there was a lot of stress on good governance and things like that. And I wonder, you know, in, in 2017, what will the stress be? Uh, increasingly, I think there's reflection in places like the World Bank around what would be, what is a better way forward. So I think there's both the, sort of the inter internal dynamics of Liberia and the world within which Liberia holds elections, deals with outside uh, nations, outside organizations. Um, so I think it's actually a very complex issue that uh, Liberia is going to face. That's true. Yeah, and, and just to echo uh, Dr. Dunn, I mean, I think the, uh, uh, the president is, is highly focused on the, the next uh, two, two and a half years of her own presidency uh, and with the opportunity to um, rebuild and the continued and sustained international goodwill that there is for, for Liberia uh, post Ebola. I think these next two, two and a half years are, are extremely uh, important uh, in their own right and that Liberia is now uh, again, open for business uh, is, uh, is not just an important message, but it's something that uh, the country needs to embrace and make as much progress as they can uh, while there is, uh, is the enabling environment of a strong technocratic president and, uh, and an international community that uh, is in this instance uh, showing, uh, showing patience and, and sustained support for the country. Uh, and then, as, again, as Dr. Dunn says, the, the challenge for the candidates uh, uh, as, they, as they line up for 2017 uh, is to find a way to, to build on, on that goodwill uh, and uh, with, their, with their own ideas and their, their, their improvements, um, but to not to uh, um, find themselves in, in, in total opposition uh, to, to the direction that the president has been taking the country. Um, in part, and it's not a judgment of what policy is right or wrong, uh, but, but in part because uh, you know, the direction is, is, is a long way beyond even the next president. Uh, and so the, the vision is, 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 is critical. Um, and part of the challenge has been the, the personalized nature of politics uh, in Liberia. Uh, and, and leadership is about moving beyond the day-to-day -to, -day to, to, the, to the future. Well, we've reached the portion of the program where we would like to open it up to the audience for questions. If you have a question for our panelists, we invite you to just step to one of the two microphones uh, here along the room. Also, if you're listening via webcast, we welcome your question uh, via Twitter, and the hashtag to get that to us is Liberia Peace. Um, also, if you're a little afraid of taking the microphone and you'd like to ask a question and you're here in the audience, feel free to pull out your smartphone and uh, hashtag Liberia Peace. We'll take those questions as well. Yes, sir. Please state your name. Yes, my name is Edgar Randolph. I'm a student at Emory. I was wondering if the panelists could speak to the development or lack of development of civil society in Liberia. Dr. Dunn, let's start with you. Um, I think it's a very good question, the question of civil society uh, in Liberia. The tendency historically in Liberia has been to defer to government too much. Somehow people expect that when a government is put in place that the government must provide education, health, and you know, so forth. And I'm not saying that government doesn't have a role in all of these areas. But um, uh, I think uh, uh, the Ebola, Ebola crisis has, has showed up to some extent this over-reliance of government and, and the dangers that go with that. Um, and, and, and the whole issue of making public policy has traditionally been a government monopoly. You don't have in Liberia uh, uh, independent think tanks, uh, you know, uh, outside of the government that can stand up with alternative solutions to, to educational problems, to agricultural problems, to health problems. Um, and, and, and I think that uh, as we build or try to build a democracy in Liberia, 
this is an area that we need to begin to increasingly pay attention to. What, what I have observed in terms of uh, civil society organizations, at least at one level, has been a tendency on the part of a few Liberians to acquire support from abroad uh, and use that as the basis of starting some sort of an organization that they then refer to as civil society uh, organization. Um, you, you have a large number of them, but what they do, uh, I don't know if, if it adds up to something that we can really get a hold on and say, all right, this is what we are understanding these civil society organizations that's, uh, 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 that they are playing in the society. I think that's one of the areas for, for development that, that, put otherwise, is an area that is underdeveloped that needs development. Dr. Scott. Um, and my, my sense, being in Liberia a few times, is that uh, my sense is that there are, there's quite a lot of civil society um, energy. And I would say two of the problems which might stem from the same place is that my sense is that people see power as a zero sum game. So either the government has power or civil society has power. And there seems um, a difficulty in. in which is to endorse what you were saying in a way, to, that, that civil society can be strong and the government can be strong. And that, that has seemed to be an area of tension. The other sense I have is that um, civil society organizations do have ideas and identify quite well what they think needs to be done in Liberia, but they are rarely given the chance to really run with their ideas. And here I'm thinking less of the relationship with the government than the relationship with um, external funders. Uh, and so I'm struck by the frustration that certain civil society organizations have, in, which is that they very rarely get to set the agenda of change. They are rather told, here's this year we, st we are focusing on this, so if you want to get any funding, do, do X around that particular mm -hmm. issue. And I think if there was more um, trust, as Tom Crick was saying, given in civil society, uh, to identify and then plan their own solutions to things, I think you would find more sustainability there. Uh, but I think also I, I, I'm struck by how um, there's a lot of um, tension around power and that we, for Liberia and many places, maybe including the United States of America right now, I think politicians and civil society need to be able to see um, that the best thing for a country is to move forward together. Um, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, I mean, I think the, the, the situation in, in Liberia for, for uh, civil society is, is evolving and uh, becoming uh, slowly, slowly, slowly sort of stronger and, and, and healthier and, and sort of more responsible in terms of its uh, political engagements. Um, I, I agree entirely with Pam that uh, uh, these are resources that the international community uh, and the government needs to find better ways to engage with and harness. Um, and uh, in Liberia, if you're not in the government, then you're in civil society, and it is a very complicated and competitive and, and uh, 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 arena um, but for for people who who are there and and who know who are the people who will work uh, when they're not being watched and, and won't uh, resources should should find their way there and, and that's a you know that's always a challenge in the development arena of taking the the huge world bank dollars and translating them through the various sort of filters and bridges into uh, you know, manageable packets that small organizations can, uh, can use. Uh. Yes, ma'am. My name is Gabriel, and um, one of my passions in science is zoonotic diseases, um, so how animals transmit diseases to humans. And um, I wanted to know if you could talk more in depth about the conversations you had within the community about zoonotic diseases and um, how high uh, was it a priority for you to have these conversations? Um, thank you. Interesting. Well, I think this, the safest thing for me to do there is to say that you know, we didn't have these conversations because we're not you know, health experts. 
uh, and that uh, you know, it was the Ministry of Health was, was engaging on, on the detail. Um, on, on the other side of that, uh, the, the one of the areas that has been uh, most challenging um, to the communities is, uh, is the area of um, uh, 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 protein and the question of whether uh, you can eat uh, bush meat. Uh, and it, it's fairly clear that communities have not embraced that message fully, at least in, in remote areas. Um, but that yet Ebola is, is, still, uh, um, is still on the decline. Uh, I think in this instance, the outbreak has been traced to uh, an individual a child up in the Guinea rainforest who is exposed to a, just a, a huge amount of, of bats uh, and that it's a single case of transmission, at least that's my uh, understanding, single case of animal to human transmission. Um, Anyone else like to weigh in? Well, just, just from my, uh, again, I'm, I'm not a, a scientist, but just from my reading is that I think communities have a uh, reason to uh, be, be a bit suspicious of arguments that they have to give up every, every the way they've been eating for you know decades and centuries because historically that has been safe and so I think um, if indeed it is the case that communities have to change what they're eating in a particular arena then it has to be a conversation because it's very unconvincing to tell people you have to stop when they know that empirically they've been absolutely fine for centuries so I think it does have to be a conversation about changing land use, deforestation, uh, the fact that bats and humans are maybe now in areas and eating palm oil that they didn't used to before. So it really, I think, has to be a conversation. And I do think that is the, one of the big lessons of Ebola in Liberia, um, is that Ebola and many other diseases aren't just a health issue. They have to be a, an, an issue of political economy and discussion, and that you, you cannot just treat it as an, as an issue of science. It, it has to be an issue of people and communities. And, and I think people are having those conversations exactly. now. Uh, mm -hmm. Even the traditional chiefs talking about things having to do with traditional burials and things mm -hmm. of that sort. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they are opening their minds and being prepared to adjust to the modern world, if I may put it that way. Some of that is going on as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, this may be a big ask, but um, a big ask, uh, but um, in the conversations that you have um, in the presidential elections, um, I studied veterinary epidemiology for some time, and the language in that field is very complicated. So in the case that there are three or four bats that may transfer over to three or four kids, um, I think that the conversation really needs to be had uh, within the communities of the animal health, the Ministry of Health, and human health because I mean, it can really be quadruple devastating um, in the case that it is spread through more animals to more humans. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question on this side. Uh, I am a little nervous standing at the microphone, so it's <laughs> to me. Um, I'm interested, I've been reading a little bit about the Carter Center's activities uh, in um, access to justice programs. And uh, I was reading a bit about the community legal advisors, so this idea of educating people to then further go out to um, perhaps more remote communities or places farther away from the bigger cities to teach people about access to justice. And I'm aware of a similar program in uh, Sierra Leone, but um, coming at this from my perspective, I was in the Peace Corps in Mali about 10 years ago, and I was living in a very rural village, and um, they, the people that I worked with really didn't go to the city very much or use these kind of um, formal legal institutions, but they did have their own methods of conflict resolution, which um, to a large extent worked very well for them. And so I wonder sometimes about um, programs that go in and work with these things, uh, these issues, if they run the risk of displacing um, methods of conflict resolution that have been working for people for quite a while, or from divide risk dividing communities into people who are able to use this new method of going to a court to people who don't feel comfortable using accessing that maybe because they can't read and write and they don't feel um, comfortable using that access. 
dividing these communities then into people who do have access and to people who feel like they're being sidelined. And I saw this program in action when mm -hmm. I was in Liberia. So Tom, I will ask you to address this first. How do you resolve that? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, a fascinating uh, question. Um, I think one place to start is that more than, according to UNDP, more than half of the world's population have no meaningful access to justice in the formal sense. So what you're describing is half the world's population who figure it out without the benefit of, of, of lawyers, judges, and magistrates. Um, uh, the Access to Justice Project, we have, part of it works with the chiefs uh, on um, uh, what we call uh, sort of leadership empowerment and education on peace building, and another piece of it works with the community justice advisors. Now, you're absolutely right. It, it is the height of presumption to suggest that you could teach um, uh, a, a chief in Liberia how to, how to resolve a case. Um, prima facie, this is what, what they do. However, the uh, question is, do they do that consistent with uh, the law? Uh, and so what you're adding there is uh, a dialogue about the understanding of what the, the state says is, is the just way to handle things. Um, consistent with uh, you know, whatever human rights obligations they have at the very highest levels with their um, uh, approach to solving a problem. So if you have a, a practical problem, uh, such as uh, you know, non-payment of, of, uh, of, of child support, which exists in, in every community, you know, do you uh, handle that in a way that um, you know, heals and solves the problem? or are you handling in a way that is, is inconsistent with the law by using punishments or, or practices such as trial by ordeal that, that may be um, inappropriate. So, that, so that, that, that's one element. And then the other element is, is to a degree choice. Um, you, uh, a, an individual in the community can have the choice to go to, to the chief or the court, but neither of those may be meaningful to them. Um, if you're a, a woman, uh, you'd be going to a sort of a patriarchal system through the chieftaincy system, um, and, or you try to go to the court, but you, you don't have the resources to get there. Um, and so there are, you know, there are alternatives that can come into there. And again, using sort of community civil society people who, who know about the law, uh, these are people who um, are, are pro bono, it costs nothing. When you ask people who do they trust, um, you know, it, it's, it's not the chief necessarily first, and it's certainly not the government first, and it's certainly not the lawyers first. They'll probably say NGO. Um, and so at least on an on a interim or temporary basis while you're trying to, to stabilize, um, free access to impartial legal advice can be very helpful, and it can be, create competition as well. I mean, the idea is that everybody is has a common understanding from the courts to the NGO to the, to the chiefs at the end of the day on what, uh, what the law is and how it should be enforced. And this is, I think, part of the, the challenge of, of, of reconstructing a state when, as Dr. Dunn said at the beginning, you know, things have fallen apart. The social consensus, the social fabric has, uh, you know, if not gone, but uh, just fractured in so many pieces um, that you have to find a common language. And, and so that's part of the, the effort. I mean, providing practical services, but also um, doing it in a, in a sort of holistic way. Dr. Scott. That was a really excellent question, because I think these are challenges, as Tom was suggesting, that face so many uh, post-colonial countries which have legacies of two different kinds of laws. Um, but I just want to say, I, th I also think it depends on what arena you're trying to work in. Um, I followed the Carter Center's um, program in the Southeast Liberia and uh, sort of followed the, some of the, the, the community legal advisors in their work. And I was really struck in one particular case, um, a, a community, uh, their land was being encroached on by a big rubber, French rubber company. And the community legal advisor was there to help them figure out if they had a suit. In, in, and it would be hard to imagine, you know, the local organizations or, or customary law being able to deal with that. However, what was really interesting about that case too was that 
um, it was clear that there was a role for the customary legal system in the sense the chief was, uh, we went to a, a meeting where the chief um, and local leaders were telling the oral history of the community to the younger people. And in the course of telling them that, they were also giving a story about access to land and, and the, the, the clans claim to particular parts of land which would then actually become part of a legal case against the, the, the company. And so I was really struck by the need for the community legal advisors to help that particular community access a different kind of law, but also that, that uh, the success of that case would depend in fact upon local understandings and, and laws. Um, so it, it was symbiotic in the best sense. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks. Just picking up on uh, Dr. Dunn's point about the imperial presidency in Liberia, um, I was wondering whether you think, or whether the panel thinks, the President Sirleaf's moves towards uh, the decentralization and the deconcentration of power could actually risk undermining future government's capacity to pursue, uh, never mind a developmental agenda, but any agenda at all, uh, rather than necessarily reinforcing government capacity. Dr. Dunn. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering whether you're talking about that we, we are weakening the center Sure, we, so, um, um, okay, so, so last week, President Sirleaf has announced that she's going to have this, well, for a long time we've been talking about they're going to uh, localise power and send the power out to, to the counties. But my worry is that at the moment, a lot of what's been achieved in Liberia has been achieved because we have, in my opinion, such a, a huge concentration in power in this, uh, in this one office and does send in all the, this power out to local level institutions where it might be more difficult to have oversight over them. Um, does that actually risk undermining the capacity for developmental change in Liberia? Mm -hmm. The potential is there that if one isn't careful that problems could develop. Uh, so that I think that as one goes about it, and one is going about this, uh, uh, one, one is uh, approaching this in a way to try to uh, bring government closer to people. People feel uh, in some sense alienated from from the government because the government is so far away from them. Uh, the government is in effect dictating things to them, sending things from Monrovia down to them. They would like an opportunity to uh, elect their own leaders so that they have easier access. Now, uh, in, in order to do that in a country like Liberia, you have to be prepared to do this in stages. You have to be prepared to do it in a way that you, you prepare people at the government, government, local government level to undertake the responsibilities of governance at those levels. So this isn't something that is likely to take place overnight. Uh, I, I think you make a good point when you say that um, we would be undermining what it is that the government is doing in the area of, of development, but at the same time you have to understand that the whole purpose of government is to serve people. And, uh, the, the idea here is that people are best served if they have a say in, or, or they have the kind of access to those who represent them in government. Tom, you'd like to chime in? Yeah, no, I, th I think there's uh, uh, a very real risk that through a decentralization process, uh, you, you end up sort of devolving the same problems that you have at the center. Uh, to to the periphery, uh, and so it, it's it's critical that you build into uh, any kind of process a real focus on uh, on accountability uh, and transparency, uh, so that um, communities can uh, have uh, mechanisms to hold their, their local government uh, uh, accountable. Um, I think in more than simply through through election because you know, politicians are elected and then they come back four years later sort of thing. Um, so if, if that can be built in, um, that would be uh, you know, a necessary component. Decentralization globally is, has, has been a fad, but I think in, in Liberia it's, it's a little uh, more than that. It's, it's, uh, a, a, a represents a mistrust of, of, of the center and as Dr. Dunn says, you know, the need to get, need to fix that and to get government uh, closer to the people. Other questions? Yes, sir. My name is Kedrick White. Um, on the same topic, and you were talking about some soft issues earlier, the mindset is a, is a major issue. And 
most people think, and from the past, from a long time ago, people, you get into government to get what you can get. Mm -hmm. And even now, it's, it's, it's much more. So what are some of the things that could be done or are being doing with respect to changing the mindset? People really have this crab mentality where you're just climbing on top of one another, mm -hmm. and it's, it's really bad. So we are a product of our society, but our society is a direct result of who we are. Mm -hmm. So it's a major issue as we talk about this. It's a vicious cycle. How do, yeah. you, how do you break yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think, I think you, you, you make a good point there as you raise that, that question. And the first thing I would say is that the tendency is to look in the direction of government whenever issues like mm -hmm. these are raised. So look, government, tell us what you're going to do about this. And I think one of the things that came up during this Vision 2030 exercise that I had mentioned earlier on was precisely the question of, so what will the rest of society do about this? So what will the faith-based communities do about this? So what will the lawyers, lawyer groups do about this? So what will the women group do about this? So what will the youth groups do about this? So what will the rest of society do about this? Let's not just focus our attention on government, government, government. Each time an issue is raised, we say, government, what is your answer to it? Yes, you elect government. Government should have some thinking about this and should have some answers. But the rest of society has got to do that, that as well. I grew up in Liberia at a time in the 60s, for example, when we had some powerful Christian ministers who would stand up in the pulpit on Sundays and as the cliche goes, speak truth to power. Thus said the Lord, they would go. And then they would go down on what needs to be done in order to change that mindset that you're talking about. Uh, Tom and I were having a conversation earlier on and we we're looking at the changing role of the church in Liberia. It's changing, it's not what it used to be. So, um, that's what I would say. We must look out there, we must put those questions to these other communities out there in the country and say to them, if you don't stand up and figure out something to do to bring about this mindset change, then, you know, we're going to keep going around in cycles and we will not make progress. For any of the panelists, though, how feasible is that? Uh, I mean, are the structures in place where people at those levels will have that conversation, will, will actually take that power that you just suggested? I think with the, the opportunity of, of decentralization and deconcentration is to create the mechanisms um, uh, that can uh, demand uh, a higher standard of transparency and, and accountability. Uh, I mean, I, I agree entirely that this is a, uh, a core challenge. Uh, perhaps, you know, and certainly post-war, you could see this exacerbated in the sense that people were, you know, you're uncertain about what tomorrow will bring, so you'll, you'll, you'll grab for today. Um, as development uh, comes to Liberia, uh, as it, uh, as we all, all believe it will, this may start to have some alteration as people have some measure of uh, you know, independent resources that aren't uh, um, so closely tied to uh, either patronage or, or, or government systems. Uh, and just the fact of, of describing the problem. Uh, you listen to the radio on, in Liberia, and, and uh, people say this all the time, all, all day, every day. It, it's, it's our problem. We, you know, we, 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 need to, we need to change our mindset. So, um, this, this. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, my name is Snow Lord Broplay. Um, my question is around um, capacity building. Um, there's been a lot of um, versions of recruiting professionals from abroad to go back home to work um, with government or with other um, private institutions. My question is, are we intentionally looking at pragmatic ways to organically grow our capacity? 
because I'm a professional abroad, but I know that me going there will not affect the change that is necessary. It needs to be organic, meaning like the young ones. Um, so are we focusing on education right now to do that? What's our strategy around like developing that pipeline? Dr. Skull. Uh, actually, this is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> I, I think, um, I think two things. I think there are efforts to develop capacity within Liberia in a, in a sort of capacity is traditional sense. So I do think uh, President Johnson certainly has really tried with, with regard to education. Ebola, again, has put a, you know, a wrench in that. But I think she really has made efforts there. For me, the challenge, and this is a much larger challenge than just for Liberia, is I think, I really think we, I think we're trapped within very narrow understandings of what capacity is, uh, be it within the Democratic Republic of Congo or Liberia or wherever. And so we tend to think, and I think President Johnson certainly sees it this way too, so we tend to think of capacity as, are you highly educated? Are you an engineer? Are you whatever? And when I look at, let's say, the Democratic Republic of Congo in the eastern, uh, in the Kivus or in parts of Liberia, it seems to me people have capacity. They've gone through a war, they, they have capacities, and the problem is, is, we, is that both government and international development, it's, it's, they can't see the capacity that's there. And I think if we could in, both recognize the capacities that people do have um, and respect it, you might get the kind of organic changes um, in, in willingness to really imagine a different Liberia and Democratic Republic of Congo. Because I think our whole world, I'm an historian of colonial, the colonial era in Africa, primarily, and I think we work, we work with colonial concepts that have now become international concepts. And I really think for, to me, Liberia is a, fan, a fascinating place because it's on this cusp of really being able to imagine something different it could actually be the incubator for a whole new way of thinking about Africa, about thinking about the post-colony, about the future. Um, and, and Liberia really could be the place that, that, that shows us how to do that. But I actually think it, it means breaking away some, from some traditional ideas about expertise, capacity, and even governance. Uh, yeah, um, Tom. Uh, I, mean, I, th I think in, if we could sit here and say that identify all these problems uh, and but then say that but the education sector is, is strong and healthy and, and the youth are coming through um, we would be uh, you know, we would be in good shape uh, I think the, the that's not the case um, you know there are problems 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 on problems uh, simply with the administration of government uh, and the education sector is, is certainly no no different well, I think this is part of what I mean by taking a look at our 10 years of experience. Uh, education was President Sirleaf's number one priority when she came in, into government, and there's no questioning the, the seriousness of, of, of the commitment there. Mm -hmm. And yet when we come back 10 years later, you know, what have been the successes, what, what, are the, uh, what have been the failures, how can we collectively as the international community and, and the Liberian government uh, put those students in the classrooms, put the teachers in the classrooms and, and qualified teachers in classrooms, teachers who are paid regularly and have you know, established a system that can, uh, the country can really build on. In the final word, Dr. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I, I'm coming at this from a slightly different perspective, and that is I, I'm, I'm looking, as, as you speak, I'm thinking about cleavages in Liberian society. Mm -hmm all kinds of cleavages, ethnic, religious, so forth and so on. I'm, I'm not talking about all of those cleavages. I'm talking about the cleavage that exists between homeland Liberians and diaspora Liberians. And I think that, that, that is where we, we have the challenge of looking at capacity on the ground, and there is capacity on the ground. It's called experiential mm -hmm. capacity, if you will. And obviously, there is tremendous capacity outside. The challenge is how to bring those two together, how to bridge this divide that is there that is making it difficult for these two to come together. Yes, President Selyev has succeeded in attracting a number of engineers and lawyers and doctors and all of the others uh, to, to Liberia. 
but some of them have packed up and left. Others are reluctant to go because there is this cleavage between these two groups. Um, I, again, I say that government always has a role in these things, and I'm sure government is doing what it can to address these things, but I think the responsibility, the onus is still on non-government. And non-government is you, my brother, who asked the question. <laughs> you over there, yeah. It's, it's on you and your counterpart in Liberia, and you do have a counterpart in Liberia. So the challenge is, how do you work towards bridging this divide, and the divide is there. Excellent note to end on. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have tonight, so please join me in thanking our panelists, Dr. Elwood Dunn, <laughs> Dr. Pamela Scully, <laughs> and the Carter Center's Tom Cook. <laughs> Thank you, good night. Thank you.